By the way, go ahead and uh, turn to Acts chapter 10. And while you're doing that little quiz, <clears throat> when is our next all-church prayer meeting? Tonight. Tonight. Just wanted to test you because sometimes, <clears throat> you know, you're watching the announcements, the eyes can glaze over, and you can miss that. So we hope to see you back here tonight. Well, let me ask you a question. <clears throat> Have you ever wished that you could do something really important to make life better for others? Something important to help somebody else? Maybe you've watched things around you unravel in your neighborhood, in the lives of people around you, uh, in your city, and you've wished there was something you could do, but you thought, well, what can I do? I'm not rich, I'm not a genius. I don't have political power. I'm not a person of great influence. So what can I do? Well, what if I were to tell you this morning that you already have a tool to change people's lives and change the world around you? And what if I told you it was right in front of you, it was right under your nose? If I could convince you that you really do have a tool to impact people powerfully, would you be willing to? To use it. Now we're in Acts chapter 10, <clears throat> and in Acts chapter 10, the Apostle Peter is being sent to preach the gospel for the first time to the Gentiles. And he's sent to the house of a man named Cornelius, who is a centurion. And Cornelius has gathered his friends and his family to hear Peter. And let's jump in at verse 38. And Peter says, now, you know of Jesus of Nazareth, and everybody had heard of Jesus. He was rock star famous. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good. Jesus was a do-gooder. And healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses. Can you say witnesses? And we are witnesses of all the things he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. And they also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him up on the third day and granted that he should be visible. In other words, that he would be shown to people. Not to all the people, but to who? Witnesses. Who were chosen beforehand by God. That is, to us, starting with the 12 disciples, who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach to the people and to solemnly testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. And of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. Now, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. Now, here Peter briefly outlines God's plan to change the world. And did you notice the word witness or witnesses appeared three times and the word testify, which is to witness, to give testimony. God's plan to change the world depends upon the power of a testimony. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you in this room <clears throat> have a testimony of what God has done in your life, of God's faithfulness in your life. How many, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you, the great majority, I think, of you have a testimony? And my other question is, and really think about this, when is the last time you shared that testimony with somebody? Because a testimony is a powerful thing. There are three things in this passage we want to learn about a testimony. The first thing we want to learn is that God works through testimony. Verse 40 through 42, God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible. That's very important. But not to all the people, but only to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God. 
those of us who ate and drank with him. And then it says, and he ordered us to preach to the people and to testify or give our testimony. Now, isn't that interesting? God's plan was that Jesus should appear alive, but not to everybody, but just to witnesses. Now, maybe you and I, if we were in charge, we would have had Jesus, after he rose from the dead, walk down the main street of town, go straight in the temple, and stay there for six months so that every Israelite could come up to him, shake his hand, and feel for themselves the nail holes in his hand. But that was not God's plan. You see, God, this is very important to understand, <clears throat> God does not compel belief by giving overwhelming displays that no sane person could deny. That's not what God wants to do. What God does is he reveals people's heart by how they respond to the testimony of another person. He reveals, I mean, <clears throat> God could give a testimony that nobody could deny. And then people would believe, not because they chose to, but because they had no other choice. So what God does is he works through the testimony. Now, these Jews at that time had plenty of evidence to make them believe the testimony. I mean, after all, the tomb was empty. Everybody knew that Jesus had performed many miracles. In fact, he had raised other people from the dead. And so there's always enough testimony or evidence out there that people should receive the testimony. Now, perhaps that we all wish that tonight angel choirs would appear in the sky and declare to all people everywhere that Jesus is the Son of God and the only way to salvation. But that's not going to happen because God has not given the, that honor to angels, but only to human beings like you and I. People aren't going to come back from the dead and convince others to believe in Jesus. That is something he's given to us. Testimony is a powerful, powerful thing. The second truth here <clears throat> is that the Bible itself is a book of testimonies. Acts 10, 43. Of him, that is Jesus, all the prophets bear witness. Remember reading that? That through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. The Old Testament prophets bore witness to what they saw or they heard. Now, the Bible itself is not a philosophical book of proofs on the nature or existence of God. Uh, the Bible is not an apologetics book that tries to get us to understand God, but ex by explaining to us exactly what the Trinity is or exactly how um, man's free will and God's sovereignty work together. No, it's an inspired book of testimonies of people's encounters with God. The Bible doesn't try to make us understand God as if we ever could. The Bible tries to get us to trust God based on the testimony of other people that have found him to be faithful. God works through testimony. <clears throat> John 1, 1 through 3. Or 1 John 1, 1 through 3. We read this. What was from the beginning... What we have heard, what we have seen, excuse me, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Now, this is talking about Jesus, what was from the beginning. And we know John, who wrote this, also wrote the Gospel of John. And it starts out with, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. So we know that what was from the beginning is talking about Jesus. What we have seen with our eyes about Jesus, what we have touched with our hands, verse 3. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim or testify to you also, so that you may have fellowship with us, and indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And so the door is open to fellowship with God for everyone or anyone, except that they have to accept the testimony of the disciples, the 12 apostles, people that were handpicked 
to give a testimony. Here's the third truth, and it's very, very exciting. The third truth is that God honors our testimony, and God backs our witness, Acts 10, 44. Now, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on those who were listening to his message or to his testimony. You see, since God has chosen not to use angels or overwhelming displays, since God has chosen to use your testimony, therefore, he will empower it. He will convict people's hearts as you share your testimony. God says, if you will give your testimony, I will partner with you, and I will bear witness in their heart that the things that you're talking about are true. God says, if you will start in the natural by sharing your testimony, then I will impress it upon their heart. See, this is the mystery of how lost people come to Christ is an illustration of that principle, the principle which says, without God, we cannot, and without us, he will not. So if we will share our testimony and do what we can, what he's told us to do, he'll do what only he can do, which is to convince people of his existence. Acts 1.8, we find out, <clears throat> Jesus said about the giving of the Holy Spirit, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. <clears throat> so God promised them power if they'd be a witness. And it's true today. The people who really experience the power of God, the people who really see God working around them, are the people who are willing to give their testimony. Now, what is a testimony? Well, it's a simple, simple thing. It's just a report uh, of what you have seen, of what you have heard, of what you have experienced. If you've ever had to testify in court, I have, uh, they just ask you. Let's say it's about a traffic accident, and you just say, okay, well, what did you see? Well, I was standing in the uh, intersection, and the blue truck was going through on a green light, and then I saw the red car go right through on a red and smash into the blue car. That's what I saw. That's my testimony. Now, there are such things as expert witnesses, and there are people who are there because they have some expert knowledge. But most testimony in a courtroom is simply people talking about what they have seen and what they have heard. Um, people think, I can't go out and talk to people about Jesus. I don't know enough Bible. I don't have the answers to all their questions that they're going to ask. And so I can't share. But the critical issue for a witness isn't how much expert testimony you have or expert knowledge. It's have you seen something? Have you experienced something? Can you say, this is what I have experienced of God. This is what he did in my life. A testimony is a powerful, powerful thing. <clears throat> because God honors it. John chapter 4, we're done with Acts. If you want to turn your Bible to John chapter 4, we're going to read the story where Jesus goes to a well in Samaria, and while he's there, he sends the disciples out to get food, and a woman, a Samaritan woman, approaches him to draw water. And we find out that this woman is really a kind of a throwaway outcast. She's already been divorced and abandoned by five husbands. And now, nobody will marry her. And the best she can do is live with a guy that won't even marry her. But it's the best she can do. And as she sits down, if you read the story, Jesus reveals the secrets of her heart. He ministers to her truth and love, and she is transformed. And she's got to tell somebody, and she drops the water pot right there and runs back to town. We're going to pick it up in verse 28. <clears throat> So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, Come see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? Or could this be the Messiah? Could this be the Christ? Could he be the one 
that we've been waiting for. <clears throat> and they went out of the city, and they were coming to him. <clears throat> now, although she has absolutely no standing in that community, she has no respect. She's an outcast. She probably doesn't know any scripture. Yet they respond and they come because they can see that she's been changed. They can see that she has really seen something. She has truly experienced something. And so they believe her and they come to see for themselves because she has become a witness and a witness is a powerful thing, no matter who you were before. Now let's see how the story ends, verse 41 and 42. And many more of the townspeople believed because of his, Jesus' word. And they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you have said that we believe, for now we have seen and heard for ourselves. And we know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. You see, they originally came because of her testimony. And in coming, they heard and came to believe themselves. And now they have become witnesses. You see, when somebody gives a testimony and becomes a witness, they are a bridge. They become a bridge. Your testimony becomes the bridge in which Jesus Christ speaks to another person's heart. They received her witness because she was one of them, because they knew her, and they could see the change. And can I say, it is a powerful thing when you have a peer give a testimony. Somebody who sits where you sit in life, who sees the world the way you see it, who has experienced life as you've experienced it, and when they give a testimony, it is a powerful thing. Now, I want to take a moment out. We're going to continue the sermon on witnessing, but I want to share a very special and exciting project that we have. This is a book called Kids Like Us. If you bought and read this book, Kids of Youth Venture, you have read all but one of the stories in this book. These are 23 powerful, inspiring hope-giving, life-giving testimonies of young people who went to school right here in the East County in these high schools and these elementary schools, kids that came from some very distressed situation and how they discovered the power of God and how God's love changed their lives. And we reformatted the book to put it in a much cheaper um, <clears throat> format. And our desire is ultimately to make 10,000s of these books and to put them in the hands of middle school and high schoolers right here in East County who need to hear these stories desperately, these stories of hope. Many of our East County, yeah, many of our East County kids, as you know, are born in some difficult situations where there's neglect and abuse and drugs and alcoholism, nobody's really looking out for them. And nobody's telling them about Jesus and about God and about how to live life. They're not hearing it at school. They're not hearing it from the media. They're not hearing it from the government. They will hear it from nobody unless they hear it from you. The peer group that they're growing up in is angry, self-destructive, dangerous. They're surrounded by people, drug dealers, um, predators, gangs, uh, Hollywood, and the pornography. They've all realized they can make money off these kids' pain and confusion. And nobody's giving them a hope. And it's a confusing, lonely, threatening world our young people are growing up in. Just several years ago, the Grossmont Union High School District did a random survey of 3,300 of its students. And 27% of this random survey, these students, said that they had seriously considered suicide in the previous 12 months. I want to tell you that is heartbreaking. These kids need hope. They need truth. So what does that have to do with us? 
James 1 27 it says pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this here's here's what true religion is in God's view here's God's definition here we go what is it where's the scripture where is it where to go <laughs> to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world what is pure religion well Part of it is to keep yourself unstained by the world. We understand that. God wants us to cleave and be loyal to him and his ways and not be corrupted by the corruption that's in the world, not be compromised by it. But that's only half. The other half, it says, is to visit widows and orphans or the fatherless in their distress. Now, in the ancient world, they had a lot of fatherless. Because of all the bloody wars and the terrible diseases and the dangerous workplaces, fatherlessness was a huge problem. Thank God in the modern world, we've cured most of the terrible diseases, and a very relative few fathers, compared to then, die in wars. But we have come up with a whole new category of fatherlessness because of drug addiction and alcoholism, because of prison, because of out-of-wedlock births. We have millions of fatherless. And if you'll notice, it says that pure religion is to visit the fatherless in their distress. It's not enough to say, our doors are open, fatherless, come on in. Pure religion says, you have to go and find them in their distressful situations and bring them the love and the truth of Jesus Christ. That, my friends, is what we want to do. Kids need to find the hope that these 23 kids found. We have, um, I think most of you know the statistics is, if we do not, if someone is not reached and make a decision for Jesus Christ by the time they graduate from high school, there is a less than 10% chance that they will for the rest of their life. We have 22,500 students in the Grossmont Union High School District. And of course, we have many thousands more in our <coughs> um, middle schools. And here's what we, what we want to do. We have many, many young people that want to take these books and give them to their friends and their classmates and their brothers and their sisters. If only we will make these books available to them. Our goal is to print 10,000 of these books. We want to start with the first run of 5,000. We're going to pass them. We have Bible clubs on 22 middle and high school public campuses, and those kids want to take these stories and give them to their friends. We want to give them out through Youth Venture, through our bus ministry, through Future Quest, uh, through every avenue we have. We want to share them with other ministries that are reaching kids and give them these. <clears throat> and the cost... We've got the cost down to $2.20 a book, $2.40 per book with tax. That means for $10, you could give four students this book, and they might pass it on to their friends, and their fathers and mothers might read it, and their sisters and brothers. For $100, you could give out 40 of these books. For 50, I guess it would be 20. For 500, you could give four, four, 200 of these for $500. <laughs> now, in order for us to make our first run of uh, 5,000, that's going to take over $12,000. To reach our goal of 10,000, that's going to take 25,000. So I'm going to ask the ushers to come down, and I'm going to invite you to participate in this tremendous project you see the offering right in there it says uh, kids like us and if you find that i mean you don't if you don't need the offering you can just throw it in the in the in the basket but if you want to use an envelope just put it in this envelope and realize that for ten dollars you can reach four kids with 23 life-changing stories and you can make a difference. We're going to need some businessmen to write some big checks if we're going to get our goal eventually of 25000 But everybody, for $2.50, you can provide one book for somebody that might change their life. 
If I could have the ushers <clears throat> go ahead and do that. And uh, let me tell you also that we have it aligned with a Facebook and uh, our website. And so there's some interactive things. They'll be able to go from here after reading this book, go to that website. They can get a virtual tour of one of our youth ventures. Uh, there'll be information there on how they can accept Christ. We'll be speaking to them. They can ask questions. So it's an exciting, exciting opportunity to reach a lot of young people for Christ. Well, let's get back to the message. Can I tell you, my friends, that testimony is a powerful thing. Do you realize that some people go to prison and even the electric chair or the gas chamber based upon someone's testimony? And other people are set free based upon testimony. And I want you to think about this for a moment. What it would be like if someone was being tried for a capital offense and you had a testimony that would set them free and you didn't, didn't give it. That would be a terrible thing. Proverbs 14, 25. A truthful witness saves lives. When you have a godly testimony and you share it, God can use that testimony to release his saving power in someone's life. You know, in this life, we can set our ambitions on many things. Many people have as their primary ambition to make a lot of money. Some people want to be famous. Some people's ambition is to have a large family or to have a happy marriage. But can I say, amidst all the ambitions there are in life, make this the most important one, that you have a testimony that you can share. That you obey Jesus and that you trust him in such a way that when God comes through and demonstrates himself faithful, you have testimonies to share. It's the most important thing. It's why we're here, to have a testimony. What is a testimony? It's just a story of you finding God, or maybe better said, of God finding you. It's a testimony that you have of God's faithfulness to you as you trusted and obeyed him. To have a testimony means that you believed God. To have a testimony means that you risked something on God. It means that you dared to believe him and obey him and follow him, and you found him to be real and to be faithful, and you can give that testimony. A lot of people say, well, my life wasn't very <clears throat> colorful. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I never did anything really bad. I never, I, I never suffered in those terrible things. But that, my friends, is in itself a testimony to the faithfulness of God. And you can say, can I just, can I just share what it's like to walk with the Lord and, and the faithfulness of God and how he's blessed me and my family? That's a testimony. Three things a testimony will gain you. First of all, a testimony will make you a powerful tool in God's hands because you will become his partner. God will change lives through your testimony. See, as you step out, God will move through you. As you do what you can, he'll do what only he can. Number two, a testimony will give you confidence as a Christian. If you'll remember in John uh, John, yeah, John chapter 9, <clears throat> Jesus healed a man who was born blind. And then all the Pharisees and all the teachers of the law surrounded this man and pressured him with all their knowledge and tried to get him to say that Jesus was a fraud and a sinner. Let's look at verse um, 24 and 25. So a second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. And he answered and said, Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. I don't understand your definitions, and I can't theologically debate you. I mean, after all, I was blind. I never read the scriptures. I was a beggar. I was never educated. But then he goes on to say this. Whether he is a sinner 
or not, I do not know. But one thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. He had a testimony. He had tasted of the reality and the goodness of God. And can I say to you that when you have a testimony, even though you may not ha- know how to answer all the arguments people raise, you cannot be talked out of what you know and what you've seen and what you've experienced. Three years, <clears throat> three years after, or a couple of years after I came to Christ, closer to two, I went to a Christian college where I thought I would get an education where they believed in the Bible. And when I got there, I found out that I don't even know if my professors of religion in the Bible were even saved. But I do know they didn't really believe in the Bible or some of the major doctrines of the Bible. And I was a new Christian. I was caught like a, uh, like a deer in the headlights. I didn't know how to answer all the questions and theories they brought up. But I did know what I had experienced. And I did know how God had changed my life and spoken to my heart through the scriptures. And when you know that, listen, if you're going away to college or something, if you have that experience, nobody's theory and nobody's opinion can talk you out of that. But if you don't have a testimony, if our young people don't have a testimony themselves, if they've just gone along and fit in, then they can be talked out of or talked into anything. Number three, if you have a testimony, it will enable you to become an overcomer. <clears throat> Revelation 12, verse 11. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives even unto death. Just like the blood of Jesus helps you overcome, so does your testimony. Both of these, the blood of Jesus and your testimony, is a tool or a weapon that releases the power of God into a situation. And as we bear witness to what God has done, we put the devil to flight and we release God to do great actions. You know, the church is in trouble. If all we have is men who can preach sermon out of things they learned in a book, and we don't have people who have testimonies and are willing to give them. Because the kingdom of God does not grow because of ideas people picked up in books. It grows because of a witness of what we have seen and heard and felt and tasted of the reality and the power of God. And when we share that, God moves. Today's world needs people who share their testimony. Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Life is released when we testify. And if we refuse to testify, if we hold our tongue, then that life will not be released. Jesus said that he would make us fishers, of men. And can I tell you that your testimony is the bait that Jesus uses? That's how he catches people. Jesus Christ said he came to seek and save the lost. And to the extent that we are Christ like, to the extent that we're about his business, that we're walking step in step with him, to that extent, we too are seeking to save the lost. I got saved because of testimony of my friend, Danny Cruz. Some people are ashamed to admit what they did before Christ saved them. See, I'm not ashamed to admit who I was before I met Christ. I'm not ashamed to say I was an alcoholic that I drove drunk, that I could have killed somebody, I could have been killed. That's a shameful thing. I put people's lives at risk. And I was depressed, and I was suicidal. And I'm not ashamed to admit it, because by the grace of God, I am not that person anymore. See, a lot of people, they're afraid to admit what they were before. Like, they are worried about their reputation. The gospel is all about that person is dead. 
When you're plunged in the waters of baptism, it's a grave. And that person dies. That's what it represents. That's what baptism is. And you're raised up, joined to Christ. And it says in 2 Corinthians uh, 5 that you are a new creation in Christ, that the old has passed away, that everything has become new. And I want you to realize that the things that you're ashamed of in your past, if you're still ashamed of those things in the sense that, you know, you don't want people to think bad about you, then you've never died. You've never gone through the whole gospel experience to where you know you're new and you're living without that guilt and without that shame. And you can agree with people, that was some bad stuff I did. <clears throat> See, if I did bad things and I was willing to stand before a holy God, the judge of the whole universe, and admit it to him, why would I be embarrassed to admit it to mere people. I don't need their acceptance. And what if by sharing the whole story about my life with somebody, what if that's exactly what they're going through? And because I have a testimony and I share it with them and it's just what they're going through, that becomes the bridge by which Christ enters into their world and shares it with them. If Jesus Christ went to the cross and hung on that cross to save me from the situation I was in and from the person I was, what possible other way can I show him my gratitude than to tell that story? And to tell it in a story that isn't worried about my reputation or that dead person's reputation, but in a way that brings glory to him and provides a bridge for someone else to find Christ. I'm not ashamed of my testimony. I love to share my testimony because people find Christ as I just talk about what God's done in my life, and he'll do it for you too, of course. I know many of you share your testimony all the time. People desperately need to hear your testimony. Maybe it's somebody that you have not yet met and they're waiting to hear you. It's somebody you're going to meet, another parent at the soccer field. Somebody you're going to run into at work, somebody new. Somebody you're just going to see sitting there at Starbucks. And God's going to quicken your heart and you're going to share your testimony with them. God's plan of salvation depends on you sharing your testimony. Somebody's soul awaits you sharing your testimony. Their salvation awaits you're just sharing the truth. Just saying to somebody, maybe you've known them for years or a co-worker, hey, did I ever tell you about how depressed I used to be? Did I ever tell you the story about how I stopped being an alcoholic? Did I ever tell you the story about how injured and sick I was and how I came to get my health back? Or just sit with someone, and you just talk to them. Can I have the band up here? And you just listen to what they're saying. You listen to their story, and when they're done, you say, I think I know how you feel. Can I tell you a story out of my life that's similar? Or just to say to somebody, a neighbor, you know, you see me go off to church every Sunday. You probably think that's crazy, why I don't sleep in and why I go to church. Do you mind if I just tell you the story of why I go to church? Just a simple thing like that. That's how God changes the world. Would you all stand? Lord, we praise you and we thank you that we have such a powerful and such a wonderful Savior. We thank you for this salvation. Thank you that, in fact... The old has passed away. All things are new. We've become a new creation in Jesus Christ. And thank you, Lord, that we have this honor, which we'll carry into eternity with us, that it's not to angels that you've given this role, but to us, to share the gospel, to share our testimony. And, oh, God, we thank you that you will partner with us. 
We thank you, Lord, that as we simply do what we can and share, the Lord, you'll work in someone's heart. We say, God, we want to be a bridge. Lord, help us right now. I pray that through this room, we will become bold witnesses. We'll be eager to share our testimony. And can I just tell you this one thing, that the one thing that the devil wants to do is intimidate you. He knows God's plan. He wants to shut you up. He wants to make you discouraged or fearful or whatever else so you don't share your story. God, stir us up, stir us up, stir us up. We pray that because we were here today and reflected on this truth, Lord, I pray there'll be a harvest of souls out there. If you believe we have a great Savior, let's lift up a song to him. Let's praise his name. Let's lift it up loud.